I invite you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 20. That's on page 374. 2 Samuel chapter 20. Listen as I read God's word. And there happened to be a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, Benjamite. He blew a trumpet and said, We have no share in David, nor do we have inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tent, O Israel. So every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah, from the Jordan as far as Jerusalem, remained loyal to their king. Now David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the men, excuse me, and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in seclusion, and supported them, but did not go into them. So they were shut up to the day of their death, living in widowhood. And the king said to Amasa, Assemble the men of Judah for me from uh, within three days, and be present here yourself. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he delayed longer than the set time which David had appointed him. And David said to Abishai, Now Sheba the son of Bichri will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape us. So Joab's men, with the Cherethites, the Pelethites, and all the mighty men, went out after him. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. When they were at the large stone which is in Gibeon, Amasa came before them. Now Joab was dressed in battle armor, On it was a belt with a sword fastened in its sheath at his hips. And as he was going forward, it fell out. Then Joab said to Amasa, Are you in health, my brother? Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa did not notice the sword that was in Joab's hand. And he struck him with it in the stomach, and his entrails poured out on the ground. And he did not strike him again. Thus he died. Then Joab and Abishai his brother pursued Sheba the son of Bichri. Meanwhile, one of Joab's men stood near Amasa and said, Whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, follow Joab. But Amasa wallowed in his blood in the middle of the highway. And when the man saw all the people stood still, he moved Amasa from the highway to the field and threw a garment over him, when he saw that everyone who came upon him halted. When he was removed from the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, son of Bichri. Fairy tales often end with this phrase, and they lived happily ever after. David had worked hard to bring the divided tribes back together. And if this was a fairy tale, it would end there. David returns triumphant to Jerusalem. And the tribes were all there together and happy, and they lived happily ever after. Eh. (laughs) Uh, Not, is the the phrase I put on on the title of this sermon. They lived happily ever after. Not. When David returned, he returned to toil and strife. And it plays out in the days that come. We saw last week that uh, that tempers flared between Judah and Israel, that they quarreled against each other, and that they divided once more into what could very, 
very quickly boil over into another civil war, just as David seemed to have brought peace back together. Sheba blew a trumpet, trumpet. he sounded a note of division, rebellion, and civil war once more. Now last week we considered some of the sins, common sins, that contributed to that division. A division that is typical of the temptations of the people of God throughout all of history and the common sins that are peace breakers. Similar to last week, this passage gives us an opportunity to think of other sins, other sins that break peace and that damage the unity of the people of God. And in this passage, I'd like to highlight one, the sin of selfishness. It will lead us to the call of Christ that I read earlier, the call of Christ to deny yourself rather than pursuing your own interest, to deny yourself, to take up your cross, and to follow him. There'll be three different aspects here that will come out in this passage, and we'll start with how David treated his concubines. We'll first look at David's concubines and his actions towards them. When David got back to Jerusalem, this situation confronted him. He had left 10 women behind, 10 of his concubines. My, uh, if you don't know what that is, it, they, were, uh, they were treated something like wives, but not of the same status. But they were, in a sense, uh, wives of, of David, called concubines, left behind to care for David's house there in Jerusalem. When Absalom came to town, he was uh, intent on destroying his father David, of, of seizing that for himself, and thereby seizing the kingdom. And one of the actions that he took was a very barbaric action. He took his father's wives, his concubines, those that were left behind, and he raped them. He forced himself on them and violated them sexually. And he did so in a, in, in a very public fashion, with a tent set up on the top of the palace so that everybody knew what was happening. As you can imagine, this violation would be humiliating to these women, it would be damaging on so many different levels. But I also want you to see that this placed them in a very dangerous position. Absalom's sin against them, according to the law, brought an unclean status upon them. They would be unclean to David specifically, meaning that he would never be able to be husband to them anymore. This would be a very dangerous situation for a woman in, in any age, but in David's age, the lack of someone to provide and protect was a situation that left these women potentially exposed, not only to uh, further humiliation, but to be destitute, uh, to be uncared for. But I want you to notice what David did. It's just one verse here, but it's packed full of meaning. I want you to see that David provided for them, that he protected them for, uh, from future shame, and future exposure for the rest of their lives. The verse says that they lived in widowhood uh, uh, the rest of their lives, and that's referring to the, uh, that uncleanness or the separation that was forced upon them because of their, uh, of their being violated by Absalom. But David did carefully... Uh, uh, provide for them and protect them for the rest of their lives. 
I want you to understand this in the connection to, to all of these, uh, all of the history of redemption, all the history of David that we have, we have noticed. And I'll remind you of this specific consequence of David's sin with Bathsheba. When confronted by God, David did repent. And through the prophet Nathan, the Lord assured David that he was forgiven. But he also warned David that there would be consequences, consequences that would follow after him, that there would be division and, uh, and war in his own household. We saw that with Absalom. And there was the warning that what you did in secret will be done, done publicly, and the violation of David's concubines is fulfillment of that. So in this case, these ten women remained as a humbling reminder of David's sin. You could say that their shame was a consequence of his sin, that, that their shame was his shame. As such, they were a sobering reminder to him of the consequences of his sin. But their presence would also remind David of something else, because the Lord had shown David mercy. Remember the definition of, of biblical mercy? It is when God withholds the judgment that we deserve. And that's what God had done for David. He had withheld the, uh, the fullness of penalty that David deserved. And so David would be reminded by, yes, the consequence and, 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 and the shame that had come upon him because of his sins. But he could also look and see that God had shown him mercy. Now, what should David do with these women? I would suggest that David could have acted in a self-serving way. How embarrassing to have these reminders. How embarrassing to have Absalom's trophies now around him every day and in the uh, eyes of, of all of Jerusalem. It would have been much less painful for him to, uh, to hide them away. It does say that there was seclusion, but uh, I take that to, to refer to the fact that David never went into them or never slept with them again. They were never uh, together as husband and wife again and so secluded. So David did not turn his back on these women, heightening their shame and exposing them to, to further difficulties. Instead, he, he did deny himself and he showed compassion on them. There's even a tenderness, I would, I would say, a tenderness that he shows to these women that expresses his understanding of taking responsibility or the consequences of his sin. And that way, you can see David expressing and seeing these women as, as a token of his repentance, a, a reminder to humble himself before the eyes of the Lord and to trigger even thanksgiving for the mercy that he had received from God. And in this way, this one short verse touches a very sensitive place in the Christian experience, doesn't it? Sometimes God allows the consequences of your sins to linger in your lives. Sometimes he allows those to linger even after he has forgiven you, after you've repented and and he assures you that your sin is indeed forgiven. The consequences may remain. And you might say, why would 
our loving Father do such a thing? The New Testament helps us. Paul says, be careful if you think you stand, lest you fall. And Peter says, be sober and watchful, for the enemy prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He urges you to be watchful against sins that are seeking to consume you. And the enemy itself. So one answer to that question, why would God do such, is to prompt you to Pay attention to those humbling reminders, to pay attention and to be watchful against those sins that are creeping at the door, crouching at the door, waiting to consume you. Don't let your pride blind you to your past sins. Don't let your pride seek to, in a sense, scrub your record and reputation Uh, so that you look better in the eyes of the world. Those consequences are a tool in God's providence to humble you. And at the same time, they are a reminder to you that your salvation is, is not based on your perfect record. Your salvation was and is and always will be completely of grace. You cannot clean yourself up to come to God. That's a lie. It's a lie of Satan. It will keep you away from the Lord, in fact. And it is a subtle selfishness. It says, I can present myself worthy to the Lord. Humble yourself before the Lord. Humble yourself before him, and he will lift you up. Second, let's look at Sheba's rebellion. As I already mentioned, Israel and Judah quarreled, resulting in this boiling over. Sheba sounds a trumpet, and there's, uh, there's this division that so quickly uh, uh, comes down on, uh, on David. You just shake your head. It says that all of of those ten tribes of Israel followed Sheba. They left. They went to their own tents. They went to their own own regions. They began to follow another rebel into a civil war. And and you you just wonder what in the world is going on. Hadn't they witnessed... David's mercy to them? That was, that was the, the theme of David's return, wasn't it? The king's mercy is demonstrated in very prominent and open ways. He showed mercy to, uh, to those who had, uh, had, uh, had offended him to his face and who had rebelled against him. He had shown mercy to Amasa, the the general, to Shimei, who had cursed him, to Ziba, who had lied to him, to Mephibosheth, who uh, had had, uh, offended him. And honestly, he had shown mercy to all of those who had rebelled, to all of the ten tribes of Israel. So to have them now, those same tribes, to turn and follow Sheba and rebellion must have felt like David got slapped in the face. He had offered mercy and it was rejected. Having been roused to his responsibilities and having shown mercy, David now responds to Sheba's revolt. When they spurned his mercy, David dealt in justice. He sent the army to quell the rebellion. And he was right to do so. He was right to do so. They had rejected the mercy that David had so so generously held out 
to the entire nation. And they spit in his face. I'm reminded again of the parable of the unforgiving servant. This came up a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it was a parable that pressed upon us that as we have been forgiven, uh, there's, the, there's the impulse for us then to forgive others. Today, I want to call attention to the last of that parable. The king forgave the, the servant a huge debt, one that he could never pay in his lifetime. And remember, he goes out, and that very same day, he finds someone who owes him a couple of dollars, and he throws him into prison. He doesn't forgive that debt. I want you to hear how Jesus spoke, how he concluded that, uh, that parable. The word got back to the king, and his master was angry. And delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brothers his trespasses. There's that impulse to forgive others, but there's also the warning that is given. The Lord is slow to anger and compassionate. He is full of mercy. He has held his arms open, calling, openly calling to all of the world to repent and to come to him for forgiveness. But if you spurn his mercy, if you reject Christ, the just judgment of God remains on you. Should you hear that again? If you spurn the mercy of God, if you reject Jesus Christ, his just judgment remains on you. Many people know and love how, the way Jesus spoke of, of the love of God in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In that same conversation, though, there's that offer of the gospel, there's that mercy that's held out. In that same conversation, Jesus also said, he who believes in him is not condemned, but... He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. John the Baptist uh, confirms this right afterward. He who believes in the Son is everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. David offered mercy to Sheba, but Sheba acted in the most outrageous example of selfishness. He rejected the king's mercy. What about you? Will you deny Christ? Will you raise your fist selfishly and defiantly against God? Then the just judgment of the Lord remains on you. Or will you humble yourself before the Lord, casting yourself on his mercy, denying yourself, picking up your cross and following him? Thirdly, Joab commits murder. There's another chapter in the complex and confusing story that is Joab. David was a military man. He he was shrewd enough to know that he couldn't give Sheba time to escape. 
They couldn't give time for Sheba to gather his forces together. That was, you might remember Hushai's gambit earlier, how he was able to convince Absalom to let David have time to escape. But David was wiser than that. He was a good military man. And so he called and commanded Amasa to take the armies and set out after Sheba. You might remember that Amasa was appointed by David. He had, he had led the armies of Absalom, but out of mercy, there was forgiveness, and David even appointed Amasa to be the new general. Amasa, not Joab. And when Amasa was delayed, David acted quickly once again, and he sent out another fighting force to track down Sheba. And David appointed Abishai as the commander of this fighting force. Abishai, not Joab. David was trying to rein in Joab in his, uh, his own way, demoting him from his role as commander of David's armies, demoting him because Joab killed Absalom, even against David's desire. So we're following Joab in this story. When the two armies come together, we find Joab there. He was in the company that was led by his brother, Abishai. And he was there, ready for battle. He had his armor on. He had his sword strapped to his side. And here comes the reunification of the two different, uh, different forces that are chasing down Sheba. And here's Amasa, the general of David's armies. And here comes Joab. It, tells the, it says the sword fell from his side. It, uh, uh, it, it, it appears to mean that, uh, that Joab let it fall by the side. Because once Joab gets up next to Amasa, the sword is somehow now back in his hand. Amasa, my brother, how goes it? Let's have a hug. I, uh, I can't imagine grabbing somebody by the beard to give them a hug, but I think that was part of the culture of the day. It was not offensive. It was, uh, it was something that was a sign of affection. But it also gave Joab the opportunity to get close, to control the situation, and to stab Massa in the gut. And then Joab lets him fall and leaves him there in the middle of the road, wallowing in his blood and intestines. It's a gruesome sight, isn't it? There was a battle to fight, and so Joab and Abishai go on. They post a man to stand beside Amasa and say, whoever's for Joab, whoever's for, for King David, follow Joab did a couple of different things. It reasserted Joab's rule over the armies and let everybody know it. And it was something of a warning. Joab's back in town. <laughs> you better not cross him. Everybody who passed by would pause and they would be warned by that. It became uh, uh, such a, a, a sideshow that it was delaying, just like uh, we call rubbernecking today. <laughs> so this man drug Amasa off to the side and covered him with a blanket, covered him with his cloak. He died there. What are we to say of Joab? Well, interestingly, Joab demonstrates that he is fiercely loyal to David. And there is a, a sense of, of loyalty 
to, to the United Kingdom of Israel, Joab is fighting for that. But as one commentator observes, it was always on Joab's terms. As powerful men often do, Joab did what he wanted to do, even to the point of killing those who got in his way. That's what he did to Abner earlier in 2 Samuel. That's what he did to Absalom. That's what he did to Amasa. Even though David wanted mercy for each of those three, but they were in Joab's way. So Joab would even defy the king, even though he is loyal. This light, or excuse me, the scene sheds light on David's failures, but that's not really the subject. Our focus is on, on Joab in this text. And here is another case that causes us to stop and to think that Joab sought his own way, no matter the cost. Joab would never leave David in the type of rebellion that Absalom and Sheba led, but Joab didn't respect David as a king. And there are plenty of reasons for that, that uh, because of David's, David's sins, but there is a selfish ambition about Joab that is, is vicious. He would get what he wanted by whatever means it took. And that does cause us to stop and think. It warns us of that sin, of, of selfishness. Now, you may never be tempted to stab somebody in their gut. I hope not. You may never be tempted to incite uh, an insurrection and rebellion in our country. I, I hope not. But what happens when you don't get your way? What happens? Will you do whatever it takes to make the circumstance come out the way you you want it. Lie, cheat, slander, belittle, bully, murder. Joab stands as a representative of those sins. Those sins within, and especially the sin of selfishness, that gives rise to all of these external examples of it. Brothers and sisters, selfishness is a cruel master. It will consume you. It may seem to you that selfishness is just something that kids struggle with. You know how toddlers uh, are, have trouble sharing their toys, and we as parents will help them to understand that. You may think that, well, I'm a grown-up now. I know how to share toys. Uh, oh, do you really? <laughs> selfishness poisons all of us whatever age we are, and it manifests itself in so many different ways. Or you may think of selfishness as a little sin, a little sin. But when you allow this little sin in your life, you'll find that you will start acting in ways to make sure you get your own way. Left unchecked, these little attitudes, these little sins will come to control you to drive you, to blind you to the fact that you really, really would do anything to get your way. Out of a heart of selfish ambitions grows division in the church. Out of a heart of selfishness grows the uh, actions that you might take to undermine your superiors at work. Out of selfishness, you might harbor ill will and nurture division in your marriage. Let this be the final application of this passage then. Jesus calls you to put to death sins of selfishness. 
He calls you to deny yourself, to take up your cross, to follow him. Pray that today you will heed those warnings of self-serving ambition, of selfishness, and instead humble yourself before the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray in humility before you that we would recognize those sins that so easily entangle us, that we can be so blind to. Instead, O oh Lord, I pray that you would help us to put to death the sin of selfishness, to put on Christ, to set our eyes on him, to humble ourselves and follow our Redeemer, Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Please take your Psalter and turn to Psalm 27D. I want you to notice uh, the commitment of, uh, of, our, uh, of ourself in this passage is that, that by faith we wait upon the Lord. By faith we, uh, we find that, that God is the one who is, is leading us. And so we ask, oh God, teach me to follow your ways. Let my life be a reflection of the light that you have given to me. By faith, let's sing this together. Psalm 27D, please stand to sing. 